Hello, Chris. Hi, Nancy. Oh my gosh. Every time I listen to that countdown clock, I usually start with feeling kind of anxious. Yeah. And then the, the music and the countdown clock just calms me down. Yeah, I, I liked the music <laughs> that they chose for it. yeah, I really like it too. So you are dialing in from DC, you said, That's right? right. And we are... Hopefully we're able, so hopefully this is a good time for both West Coast and East Coast and everywhere else in between. Today we're here to talk about how to give a great presentation. And for those of um, folks who don't know me yet, my name is Nancy. <laughs> nice to meet you all. I'm a product management coach and I'm joined by Chris, a communication coach today to tell us all about how to make effective presentations. Now, before we dive deep into learning more of the best practices, tell us a little bit more about who you are, Chris. Sure thing. I currently work as a communication and presentation coach for tech professionals, but my story actually begins in an interesting place. I started out as probably the most quiet kid in school. And I say in school because it probably was true in that I naturally am on the more introverted side. Me too. And throughout school, I would be very hesitant to raise my hand in class, to speak out loud. This is something I'm sure a lot of us as introverts in the audience can relate to. And this was fine in school because in school, there's a teacher who's looking out for everybody, but it doesn't work out so well in the workplace. And what I discovered when I started my career, primarily working in engineering and later on data, was you can do amazing technical work, but if you can't sell yourself, sell your product, sell your vision, No one's going to buy it. You have to put in the effort to advocate for yourself. I saw this time and time again while working in the data industry in particular. There was one person I knew who wasn't promoted for 15 years because they didn't have sufficient communication skills in their manager's eyes. There was one other person who I deeply respected. I'll call him Arthur for this conversation. And he was the most brilliant engineer that I knew. I would go to him anytime that I had an issue and he always had the answer. But when it came time to present, when it came time to communicate, it was never truly clear what the value of his work was because he used a lot of technical jargon and the bigger why was lost in all of that. And he was moved to a different team for reasons I don't know for sure, but what I perceived was the value he was adding to the team wasn't identified by the manager. So they moved him somewhere else. Countless other examples, but what I realized being in that field was this is a real gap in the industry, communication and presentation. So many of us have so much to offer, but don't have the tools to be able to express it well. Communication and presentation aren't often taught in school at all, at least it wasn't for me. Not for me either. Exactly. And rarely, if ever, taught in the workplace. I see so many technical trainings, how to learn a new programming language, a new tool. Rarely do I see a, a training on presentation. And I realized that my true calling, the thing that I was really passionate about doing was helping other people with this. Managers had pulled me aside in previous yearly reviews or one-on-ones to tell me, hey, you're, you can do well with the technical stuff. That's why we hired you. But when it comes to these soft skills, that's something that's really unique about you. You can communicate well with the business. You can present well. And no matter what you do in the future, Don't lose that because that will help you succeed wherever you go. And I said, okay, I will take that advice. I want to help others do well with this. And I decided this year to become a communication presenter. Oh my gosh, that story resonated with me so much. Um, I am, I've always been very introverted. I think I'm even more introverted now than before. I was always a quiet kid. I don't know what it was. It just didn't feel comfortable for me to speak up or just didn't feel comfortable for me to even... share whatever I was thinking about. Um, and then I actually cannot remember why I decided to work really hard on my presentations at work one year. Something just clicked. I don't think, 
nothing really happened. I was never given feedback that my presentation needed work.、Um, but I had a mentor who introduced me to the concept of storytelling, <clears throat> and then I was able to incorporate. Um, those learnings into my presentations, and in that year, my career just grew. It wasn't because I was a better PM at working with engineering.、It、wasn't because I became better at shipping products. It was only because I became better at giving presentations.、Um, and so, till this day, I'm still super grateful to that one mentor I had who introduced me to storytelling. I had no idea. So, for you, how did you learn to get better at presentations? I, similar to you, had a mentor in high school who inspired me. This was the phase where I really didn't want to talk at all during class, and she pulled me aside and she said, "You have some of the best work in this class, but nobody knows about it because you don't participate." And she said to me, "As it was almost like..." More than a mentorship, it felt like a real personal connection with this teacher that I had. And she said, "I really want to see you succeed, and to do that, you need to work on your communication and presentation skills. You need to be able to feel comfortable and confident to speak in public settings." And I realized then, I'm truly grateful to her for pointing that out and putting me on this path, because if I didn't. Put in the effort and the time to work on my presentation skills. I would still be really far behind in my career.、Mm-hmm. And speaking to what you said before about how I'm not really sure either why I was so hesitant to speak up. For me, it was partially personality, but I also think it is partially due to cultural heritage, at least from my perspective.、Mm-hmm. In the culture in which I was raised, and it's more valuable to not stand out too much,、mm-hmm. and it's more valuable to do the Do the hard work, but not really be noticed for it. Not be too, yeah. Don't brag too much about it. Yes, no bragging. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And I, I really held those values for a long time. And I think the struggle that happened for me was when I entered the workplace.、Mm-hmm. For many of us in the audience here, we work in these Western style workplaces where it's really valued to communicate directly instead of indirectly and suddenly. Yes. And it's important to advocate for yourself, to speak up when you disagree, and that those were ideas that I really struggled with for a long time because they clash with my cultural upbringing. Same. Oh my gosh. Um, what I realized was speaking up doesn't mean that you're bragging.、Okay. To me, I kind of equated that to be similar. Because we're taught to be humble, right. right? We're taught to just do good work. We're taught to not be aggressive, be be humble, keep learning,、uh, don't brag. But then that doesn't work well when we leave school、mm-hmm. and we we enter the corporate、uh, world. That was. It took. It took. Time for me to realize that it was a different environment with different expectations.、Mm-hmm. For a lot of my clients, I teach aggressive versus assertive communication, which I think is such an important line to draw in the sand. That if you want to speak your mind, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're stepping on someone else's toes.、Mm-hmm. If you state something assertively, just directly, professionally, and politely, of course. Then there's no reason you should be afraid of that, right? And that's such an important thing to remember when we approach any kind of conversation. How did you learn all the best practices? It was really the mentors that I had along the way,、mm. and it's interesting because I have a very eclectic background that informs a lot of the way that I teach. After school, high school, when I entered college, I wanted to become a composer and work in the film industry. Music composer.、Uh, Yes, a music composer. Wow! I wanted to write music for the big Hollywood films, become rich and famous, and live in Los Angeles, California. <laughs> and I worked for a long time to make that dream come true. And my experience working in music and writing compositions informs the way I teach because communication really is music. At the end of the day, you're trying to tell a story to someone. You're trying to captivate their attention. 
you're trying to use vocal variety, let's say, and all these techniques to make the sound of your voice interesting. You're using body language to captivate attention as well. And it's really like music. Communication is an experience. I think of it that way. It's a good presentation is not just about telling people information, but it's really about the experience of that information that matters. An analogy I like to use that's informed by my music experiences, people will pay to go to concerts, even though all the music is free on YouTube. And why do they do that? Well, it's because they're not just seeking the same information, the same music. They're seeking an experience of that information that will make them feel good and that they can participate with other people. So whenever we give presentations, it really boils down to thinking of it like music, thinking of it like an experience that people will remember and that they would want to go again to in the future. Oh my gosh, I love that. I've never thought of it that way, um, but it's very true. So in high school, um, I was a very active uh, piano student um, and I went to all kinds of recitals and we had to volunteer at the Honolulu Symphony Concert Hall. So I, I grew up in Honolulu. And that meant that I spent a lot of time in these concert halls and I was able to um, attend a lot of concerts. And the quality and the experience that you get from attending these concerts live and these performances live it's just so different from, let's say, listening to a CD. So back then, <laughs> it was CDs, no MP3s at the time. It was, it was very different. Um, and there was a reason why uh, our teacher made us volunteer at the concert hall, was to give us, to, to demonstrate what that experience would be, just being there in the present moment with live music. Yeah. Okay. Now, now I have to think about all my presentations differently. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. So what I want to do in this live stream is uh, first, I will invite Chris to share with us some of the foundational um, understandings that we all need to have when we think about uh, presentation best practices. And Chris would also share with us some uh, real examples of what good visuals look like versus not so good visuals might look like on a presentation. Um, and then we'll also have, we'll also answer some questions that came in through the sign up form. And if there's um, comments or questions that, that come in live through the comments, um, we're, we're also happy to, to address as well. Um, just before we go into um, sharing the foundational best practices. We have some comments coming in live. English being my third language, I believe is what makes me nervous about speaking up. I hear you. It's my second language. It's not my third, but I, I agree. What do you I, think I work a lot with clients who are non-native English speakers. And this often comes up that a huge reason for their anxiety is because they don't feel comfortable with the grammar, the syntax, are they using the right word? And I, what I try to convey in my sessions with them is that learning English is of course an important part of communication, but it's the technique of communication that perhaps is even more important than let's say those tactical skills. So it's the right mindset going in that will let you communicate well, regardless of what words you know, regardless of the grammar that you use, you, if you know how to speak effectively, then whatever baseline that you have, you can use well. I love that. I love that you mentioned mindset. Can you repeat for us what is the right mindset we should, we should have in situations like this? The right mindset boils down to what we were just chatting about earlier. And it's something that I feel like is often the misunderstanding when it comes to presentation, that a presentation is not about giving information. Mm -hmm. I feel like many of us think about them that way. And for that reason, we design them in ways that aren't as effective as they could be. We design slides with tons of text on the page right. because we want to inform. We want to give the audience as much information as possible. But 
the real purpose of a presentation is to inspire action and to give a good experience. And when you think of it from that mindset, you start designing completely differently. You start saying, oh, I, I should take away from the slide so my audience can get a good experience of the information. You start adding more visuals because you say, oh, people like visuals. That'll make it easier for them to understand. If you just switch that one mindset, mm -hmm. I say that gets you 70% of the way there to get it giving a good presentation, just the mindset alone. Oh my gosh. Because if you have that, everything else about good presentation falls into place very naturally. I think the key phrase that I need to put on a post-it next to my monitor is inspire action as Absolutely. the key takeaway for any presentation that we do. I love that. All right, so now let's start by talking about tips that you have for us to deliver impactful presentations, how to stand out, how, um, what makes presentations good. Number one thing would be that idea that a presentation is not just about giving information, but about inspiring action. And a story that I can share about that is my first year in college, I attended my very first college lecture, General Chemistry 1, because I was a pre-med major. And I was excited for this class. The room was packed. I could barely find one seat. And the, the professor seemed like a very nice person as well who was very knowledgeable about the material. But as soon as the presentation and his lecture started, I had this feeling that the attendance in the room was going to drop as the weeks went by. And the reason for that was because the way that he presented was just reading off of the slides because it mm -hmm. calls back to that misunderstanding that a presentation is about giving information. And he was informing us for sure. He was giving all these slides with notes and all this information for us to digest. But at the end of the day, it wasn't inspiring us to do anything with it. Mm. And I really believe that a presentation is not about giving information because if it was, he could have just sent an email out to us with his slide decks that contained all the information that he recited word for word to us. And we would have all that information, mm -hmm. which makes him redundant as a speaker. Mm -hmm. He's just reciting everything that's already there. And a tip for giving a great presentation is remembering that you, as the speaker, are the presentation, not your slide deck. Mm -hmm. We often focus so much at creating good and pretty slides, which is, of course, important. But the more important thing is focusing on yourself, how you can complement what your slides say instead of just repeating. Wow, I have to um, take a second to take that in. Why do you think most of us put so much information on decks? I think it boils down to that idea of mindset that we go in mm -hmm. wanting to inform. Mm -hmm. But it also comes down to a lot of pressure I feel that happens in the workplace. Whenever I'm asked, for example, to, get, to give a presentation, to create a presentation, my manager would ask me to create the slides for it. And then they would review them with me one by one to make sure they were going to be in a good state for that presentation. And there's such a focus on slides that we forget that it's our voice, our body language, the way we deliver the information that perhaps is more important than the information itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we start to just change that mindset, change the way that we approach things from the get go, we can start delivering more effective presentations. Take that in, folks. This is gold. <laughs> it's a complete mental shift on how we think about presentations. I think the part that it that took me a while to understand is, well, if I don't put the information on the slide, what if I forget? Right. And I don't know if my approach is the correct approach here, but how I kind of address that anxiety or that worry is, Okay, well, let me memorize it. <laughs> how, do you, how do you handle it? I, I faced a similar challenge when I was trying to find the best way to prepare for a presentation. I remember there was one time in high school I was giving a presentation on astrophysics, I want to say. And I created the whole PowerPoint deck and everything. And I memorized every word I wanted to say word for word for that presentation. And on presentation day, I felt so prepared. I said, okay, there's no way I can mess up because it's all in my head, the script. And something went wrong that day. I think the tech broke, someone coughed, 
And I just lost my place in the script. I said, oh no, what, what paragraph was I on? What word in that line? And I just froze. And I said, I, I, I can't finish this. Eventually I picked myself up, but it took a while and I was embarrassed. And from that day on, I realized that the key to preparing for presentation well is not memorizing word for word, but memorizing the outline of the main points you want to say. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, rehearsing it before. Yes. Rehearsal is really the golden key to giving a good performance because then if you rehearse multiple times from different angles, different durations, then you're prepared for anything. If the presentation needs to be cut short by half, half the time, just because the previous speaker took longer, you're ready for it because you already rehearsed well and you don't have to worry about getting every single word right. Do you think the time it takes to rehearse would decrease over time as we get better? at yes. prepping the right way? Absolutely. As with anything, I believe, with more practice, it yeah. becomes easy. Uh, for me, uh, I gave a in-person talk. Was it last week or this week? Oh, no, right. it, was, it was last week. Yeah. It was a 30, it was a one hour session, but the content that I prepared was 30 minutes. And I rehearsed for hours. I think most people don't allocate that much time to the prep. Um, but I really didn't want to put all the information on the slides because a good thing I, I visited that venue before the presentation and I knew that I couldn't really see the monitors unless I stand behind my laptop. But I didn't want to st stand behind my my laptop, like behind the podium. I wanted to stand in the middle of the room. That means I would be exposed with nothing to look at. So I knew I had to memorize and it actually worked really well uh, because it, exactly like what you said, Chris, when you rehearse and when you know your content really, really well, you could go off script right. and it's totally fine. Um, so it's not about writing out word for word. It's, uh, for me, what was helpful was, okay, I have this flow of information and this is how I would, um, this is how I would follow the flow. And then the slide kind of just had keywords on it here and there to just keep me honest on which part of the flow I'm on. So yeah, totally resonate with that. Now that's that's exactly what I recommend when it comes to preparing, that you should know not just the material you're presenting, but I usually recommend knowing, let's say, three times more than that so that you can navigate to different areas as oh you gosh. go. And the key to that is anticipating questions. Mm -hmm. That's how you expand your knowledge base three times more than what you need to present. You can say, okay, if, if they see this slide, what question might they ask? What people would What would people be interested in? given that this is the audience that's present. And when you prepare all of that additional material, then you can riff off it. You can go into different directions depending on the audience's questions and interests. That's the key to being prepared. And then there's the other element that I needed to prepare for, which was the physical body, like right. hand-eye coordination. Um, I Since COVID, I've been remote from home and I got really used to a Zoom call and kind of like just pressing my keyboard to advance the slides. But then in an in-person situation, I am no longer behind my monitor, right? I'm standing there. How do I stand? What do I do with my hands? And I had a clicker, right. but how do I even use the clicker? So when I was practicing at home, I would take away the chair that mm -hmm. I'm sitting on. I would just stand against this wall and I, I would hold onto like my chapstick because right. it's roughly the same size as a clicker. And right. I would, you know, practice like with my thumb, like, okay, this is how you like advance the size. So everything to me was just like muscle coordination between my hands, my fingers, my, my mouth, my mind, <laughs> like everything. That, that, was very, that was very well said. And I, I recommend the same thing for any in-person talk. A lot of people feel a lot of anxiety before a presentation. And what I recommend 
is not just visualizing yourself doing well, which is a way to perhaps ease those nerves, hmm. seeing, okay, I'm going to do a good job. I can imagine all the people applauding and myself giving a great delivery, but also actually visiting the venue does wonders for easing the nerves. You know exactly where you're going to stand. You can picture yourself or actually walk up the stairs to the podium. And if you can go through all those motions and then do all that rehearsal to walk through your material, there's nothing you have to be afraid of because you've already done it. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. I'm very grateful that I was able to visit the venue ahead of time. Um, otherwise, I think I would have expected to see my slides. Um, if that was the case, I wouldn't have memorized it so much. So that was definitely very helpful. Anything else you want to share on this topic of how to stand out and how to make the presentation good? I think we covered a lot of great bases so far. Cool. We have um, a comment here. Let me see if I could bring it up here. LinkedIn user. One second. I often have to present a doc. I struggle because I think it could be read easily. Okay. So I, my interpretation of the question is that you might have to present documentation or maybe something that's very information heavy and your concern is if people can understand it. And what I usually recommend when it comes to presenting anything information heavy is to reduce as much as possible when it's the presentation layer. So if you have, let's say, documentation about a product that you've created, that's fine to distribute after the meeting as a, an attachment, but if you present it, it's good to distill it to the most important points per slide and let anyone read the slide, let's say within five seconds, then listen to you speak. If they're trying to read the slide and mm -hmm. listen to you simultaneously, they're not going to get either thing. Just like right. we can't listen to two conversations at once, let them focus on one thing at a time, just the slide for a few seconds, and then listen to you. There are some companies with a heavy writing culture where instead of building decks, they just write docs. And in these meetings, people are presenting docs. Do you have any advice on how to make that experience more effective? I would recommend that if you present anything that has a lot going on at once, mm. that you hide away the parts that are not relevant when you're speaking. So let's say you're presenting a very complex diagram that has all these boxes everywhere, a lot going on. Present only the part that you're talking about at a time make it visible and hide everything else with more opaqueness, opacity. And if you do that, then people can focus on exactly what you need them to as you progress along. Then as you talk about additional points, reveal those other parts of the page. Then they can see everything all come together, but you're just talking about the most relevant thing at each moment. Mm, yeah, I love that. Is it kind of like a zooming in and zooming out kind of like, this is the whole picture, and now I'm only talking about this part of the picture. Kind of like that, mm -hmm. but also if you can imagine a slide that has a huge diagram, mm -hmm. and in the upper left corner is where you start, then making just that little square white and visible, and the rest mm -hmm. a darkened color, so they yeah. can't really see it, but they right, can right. see it. Right. That's the way. Oh, I love that. I could already kind of like visualize it. All right, so kind of like a follow-up question is how do we meaningfully cater the info to the specific audience? I would highly recommend for any presentation, before you create any slides, before you start drafting what you're going to say, is to do research on who you're speaking to. One of the things that I noticed happen in the data industry I worked in was the same presentation would often be repurposed for, the, for different audiences and it just mm -hmm. wouldn't work Mm -hmm. because different things are relevant to those different people. If I present to the CEO, he's not going to care about all the granular details about the algorithm I used and the metric I used. He's going to care or she's going to care about how do we make the business more profitable. If I'm presenting to a technical developer, they're going to care about the algorithm I used, the metric I used. They're not going to really care so much about the profit, sales, revenue, efficiency that the CEO would care about. So before you start preparing for the presentation, 
research your audience. Maybe send them a survey ahead of time saying, hey, what are you hoping to gain from this presentation? Have a conversation with each member. See if you can find previous presentations that they've looked at recently or in the past to inform what kind of perspective do they have coming in. And also think about, again, what action do you want them to take at the end? If you know that, mm. then you can orient your entire presentation around that action, right. make that really compelling. Right. So being able to design a great presentation boils down, first and foremost, to researching your audience and their needs. Love that. We have a question from the audience. What advice do you give to those who stutter? when they have to do a presentation? I've worked with a few clients who felt that they stuttered when they spoke. And the way that I worked with them was recording yourself is one of the best ways to mm -hmm. practice on your own. And I would have them do daily recordings, minute each, where they record themselves giving part of their presentation or just a short piece of communication. And to watch themselves on video delivering that, mm. watch their pace. Mm. And usually what happens is people talk very fast when they're presenting because they're nervous and they're anxious. They want to do a good job. And I tell my clients, you have to slow down at least five, 10 times more than you think is normal because that will sound normal to your audience. So make a purposeful effort to speak slower and people will perceive that as normal. You might think that it's, it's really slow, but it's actually not. Your nerves are making you think that it, it's different from what it actually is. So for clients who feel that they're speaking very fast or they're tripping up over words, I always recommend slow down, make a purposeful effort to slow down five to 10 times, watch yourself on recordings and see how fast are you speaking and then slow down even more if it's too fast. Though. Why do you think we speak um, fast when we're nervous? I was talking to someone recently about this and they said they try to speak really, really fast because they want to get all the information out to the audience as quickly as possible so they don't run out of time. Mm. I think a lot of us are worried that we won't get to the good stuff and we'll miss it by the end. And my advice for that is rehearsal. Make sure that you know how long each main point you want to make yes. will take so that you can work around it. If a segment is taking longer than expected, know where to cut, know where to be more concise yeah. so that you reach the main points by the end. The slowing down actually works really well when we become more comfortable with the slow pace because it actually gives, gives us a little bit of space to kind of think ahead. Um, in that presentation that I just gave last week, even though I had re rehearsed hours, there were moments when I still felt a little bit um, like not like I'm not quite sure where I am in the flow. I'm kind of like thinking ahead. So slowing down and but to the audience, they had no idea about, you know, the inner dialogue that I'm having with myself. But the slower pace really gave me the space to just um, kind of like tap into what's already in my muscle memory since I've already rehearsed so many times. Um, to know, okay, what is coming next? And what is that point that I'm trying to make? I think that that's so important to remember that it's not just about what we want to say, mm -hmm. but how we say it that mm -hmm. matters. And one other trick I like adding to presenters arsenal is the power of pausing. And it's yes. something that we don't do very often because we think that we want to inform our audience. So we just say words and words and words, but ultimately, Pausing is what lets people remember the information we mm -hmm. said. And to your point, it lets us remember what we're trying to say. Yes. And I like to use a musical analogy here. When we type, let's say in a Word document, a uh, product description, let's say, we type words and we have one space in between each word. When we speak, our pauses shouldn't just be one space. They should be two spaces, three spaces, four spaces, five spaces, several seconds long, depending on the gravity of the point we're trying to make and how much we want people to remember it. So for a really important point, take the time to just pause, let it all mm -hmm. sink in. And developing that dynamism with your pauses will make you a much more impactful speaker because you can get the audience's attention when it matters most and give yourself also time to move. 
I also like to repeat myself. Right. Right. We might feel that we're being very repetitive, but the audience doesn't feel that way mm -hmm. because it's the first time that they're hearing it versus it's the th uh, a thousand. We're like, we've said a thousand times, right? right. Um, but the power of the pause and the repetition have worked really well for me. Exactly. I, I was working with a client and they were trying to prepare for a presentation and they were thinking about all these things they wanted to say and all this technical jargon they wanted to deliver. And I said to them, it's very important to think about not just everything that you know in your sphere, but what does your audience know? What would be relevant for them? And do you really need to include that level of detail? It's easy for us, especially when we get very technical, to forget how much other people know that are non-technical. I work a lot with technical professionals who get really deep, PhD level academic research deep into their material. And it's easy to forget at that point that I don't understand what, let's say, a lot of fancy scientific terms mean. And it's important to really boil things down to what the audience needs to hear and give just enough detail to make that relevant. Absolutely. We have another question from the audience. Hello, Jenna. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> I have a variety of presentations coming up on the same topic, but to different audiences, fellow team members, executives and at a conference, how do you suggest adapting the slides and what to focus on for these different audiences? I would focus on what action do each of those audiences need to take? So for your team members, what do they need to do with the information you've given? Do they need to, let's say, you're talking about a new algorithm that you've created. Do you need your team members to use that algorithm? Then maybe you should include more slides that give them a how-to, a demo, instructions about how to do that step-by-step. -step. If you're talking to an executive, do they need that information? No, not really. What action do they need to take? They need to know if the algorithm is worth propagating in the business to use it to make more money. So all you need to do is talk about the benefits and the outcome, not necessarily the features. And if it's at a conference, thinking about who is present, is it a technical audience or a non-technical audience? What action do they need to take? At a conference, it's not someone within your organization. It's some people who want to be inspired and educated by your material. So think about how to make all of this information that you're presenting engaging, exciting. Think about stories to tell, perhaps examples, analogies, and metaphors to make it really relevant to them, especially if it's more general audience. By doing that exercise for each target mm -hmm. audience, you make sure they have each a great experience. You can also tell them, like, this is the action I want you to take. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So, uh, next question from the audience. I often find myself prepared to present for a group or particular audiences. Then I came across questions, sort of irrelevant, <laughs> from people who just drop into the meeting once in a while. And I ended up uh, getting sidetracked side to provide more information. Uh, I'm, I'm checking uh, LinkedIn to see the, the end since it's cut off here. Um, I ended up getting sidetracked to provide more information and such. Any advice on hand to handle it? As a presenter, we are the leaders of the group at that moment. And if we get questions that are irrelevant to the topic, then we have to put them to the side. So if, mm -hmm. some, if we're talking about that algorithm and someone asks about something totally off base, then what we have to do is not answer the question and take up the time of everyone else in the room, but say, let me get back to you on that after the meeting and actually do follow up with them if it's a question that's important. But make sure that as the presenter, you're also a facilitator and make sure that the time you spend on every moment is time well spent for the entire audience. I think um, if I were to put myself in the shoes of a presenter, we have this tendency to want to you know, do a good job. We have this tendency to want to have um, answers to every single question. Um, right. We want, we want to please, we want to show up well. And part of 
setting boundary and controlling the flow of the presentation is a mental shift for a lot of people. Um, and it's okay to say no, especially when we have a set agenda and a point that we're trying to make, we're trying to tell you this is the action we want you to take. But if we can't get there because we get sidetracked, then we don't fulfill the original um, purpose of the presentation. I think this also takes practice to That's first become one, aware that this is happening and you're getting thrown off and to become comfortable setting boundary in these presentations. And sometimes these presentations can be high stake. Um, so setting boundary is one thing that I definitely needed to, to practice to get better at. Absolutely. And this goes back to that idea of, let's say, aggressive versus assertive communication that we talked about. If you're mm -hmm. assertive and you just say, hey, let's pull back to the topic of the presentation, I can get back to you at a later point. Or if there's a question that we don't know the answer to, let's say, mm -hmm. it's important not to waste the audience's time trying to figure something out on the spot, but just say up front, I don't have the answer for you right now, mm -hmm. but let me get back to you after the presentation. And it's important to not do that too often. Otherwise, it it does ruin a bit of credibility if you don't have the answer to anything. And that's right. where preparation and rehearsal comes in handy. But for the rare instances where yeah. you don't know the answer, it's important to remember that you are there to give the entire audience a good time and to make use of every single mm. moment. So if there's a question that's off topic or if you don't know the answer, just be upfront and assertive about it and then move forward and bring things back. Makes sense. All right. So as promised in the beginning of, of this live stream, how do we leverage decks and visuals to engage the audience? And this definitely goes back to what we've been talking about so far, that a slide should not be stuffed with a lot of information, shouldn't be stuffed with a lot of text, but really boil it down to the key points you want to make. I always say one main message per slide. That's it. Don't make mm -hmm. it more complicated than that. It's sort of like that idea of listening to two conversations at once. You can only really listen to one thing. So make that really clear on the slide. A lot of what happens when we present and use charts and graphs, for example, in addition, is we make them very a lot more complicated than they need to be because we want to, again, inform. But in order to give the audience a good experience, it's important to take elements out, strip away, until you just get to the one main insight you want them to see in the graph, make that really clear in the title, and that's how you get a, a slide that really engages the audience. Do you have examples that you can share with us? Yeah. Um, good versus not so good visuals? Absolutely. Let me share my screen. OK. Oh, share you might need to give permission. OK. If Let you haven't me. already. I think I have. Can you see my? Ah, uh, Yes, PowerPoint? yes. Perfect. OK. So let's give some examples of some good versus bad slides. And I'm going into presentation view now. I'm going to assume you can still see the slide. I should mm -hmm. say our issues. OK. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of, I'm going to say, a bad slide. And the reason for that is, to the earlier point, it has so much going on in it. There are these three quadrants with three bullet points each talking about challenges, approaches, and outcomes for three different projects. I'm overwhelmed looking at it, and I'm sure the audience is too. The way to simplify that goes back to our point about thinking, who is our audience here? What do they need to know? Let's say that our audience is a CEO of a company. What they need to know is they need to know the outcome for each of those projects. They want a high level, succinct overview of everything that we've done, let's say. And the key to doing that is taking out all the information that's irrelevant. So in this slide, I've abstracted out all of the other information that was present and only focusing on the outcomes. But even more than that, I can make this a lot more concise. You can see this line, leading global cosmetics company, that outcome bullet point is really long. I can make that a lot more concise by just focusing on the main points I want them to understand. And after that, why not add some visuals, some icons, arrange it in this kind of list format to make it a lot easier to digest. Then I can walk through each of these points one by one. So I originally started with that really complex slide, and now I end up with one that's a lot easier to see everything in one place. Simple, concise bullet points. 
Alternatively, let's say that our audience is a manager who wants a little bit more detail about each of those projects. Then let's say that we have that same slide to begin with, but we need to talk about each of those projects in more detail. How do we achieve that? Well, we can think about how do we break this out to be a little more digestible? We can focus on each project in turn. So let's focus on the first one, multinational food and beverage company. One slide devoted to just that one project. Then repeat the exercise for the other two. One slide for this project. And then mm -hmm. finally, one slide for this project. So instead of just stuffing everything in one page for ease of reference, sometimes it's better to separate it out so that everyone can see how everything falls into place one piece at a time. Another example would be this kind of slide where I'm sure this is something we've all saw. <laughs> in our businesses where it's just mm -hmm. so much text on the page, mm -hmm. paragraphs and paragraphs. What I ask here is, what is the point of this slide? What is the main message we want to convey? And perhaps if we just read it through it, really take the time to boil it down, it's just that last part that this company, three mm -hmm. circle in this case, is just one third friend finder, one third city map, and one third social game. So let's take everything else out and just make that visual. Mm -hmm. So now I see it's friend finder, city map, social game, all that other information I can say verbally. And in that way, I complement, not repeat the material on my slide. Alternatively, you can have different visual representations like this or like this, anything that makes it mm -hmm. easy for the audience to grasp within a few seconds and then move on to listening to you speak. I am often asked mm -hmm. this question, um, if I don't put all that information on the slide and I send the deck out yeah. to people, how do they like how do they get that information when they're just looking at my deck? What I would recommend in that case is to it depends on how much time that you have. <laughs> Ideally, you would have one slide deck for presentation and one slide deck to distribute that are different. The distribution slide deck would be full of the detail. Uh -huh. And the presentation slide deck would be really simple. But most of the time, we don't have time to do that. Right. So what I would recommend in that case is simplifying the slides, as I've shown, mm -hmm. but including in a, a bunch of appendix slides with all the mm -hmm. detail that you need to say. Then you have one deck that you present. Right. If people ask questions about this slide, for example, they say, oh, so tell me a little bit more about how it's a city map. Then you can go to your appendix slide, if need be, and bring up all of that detail during the presentation and say, hey, I'm also going to send this out afterwards. You can reference. So I love that, that is the best of both worlds. I love that. All right. We have questions from the audience. Yeah. Let's take a look. Um, a bit of a meta question of defining what action do you, you want the audience to take? What advice do you have about gathering the correct audience, for instance, how do you know when to gather people to inform them or bring them along versus making a decision? I was actually talking to someone earlier today about preparing a presentation with exactly this kind of question. They went into this presentation that they're preparing for with the idea that it's to inform them about what they've done because mm -hmm. they're a data scientist, they created a an important new model that they want their company to use for the past three months. And it's time to present the results of their work to the CEO and stakeholders. They thought the purpose of their presentation was to inform everybody about everything they've been working on for the past three months. But I said, the goal is really not just to inform them, but to inspire action from them. They're talking to the CEO and the CEO, I asked her, what does the CEO need to do with this information? And they said to me, well, the CEO would need to decide whether to let this algorithm be more available to other teams so we can mm. start using it more widely in the company. That's the action that that CEO needs to take, not just to know about what you're doing, but what they, should they do about it? And the other audience present was stakeholders. And I said, what action do they need to take? Not just being informed about what you've done, but what do they need to do? And they said, okay, the stakeholders will need to talk to other teams to share knowledge about this and maybe get it more widely distributed as well. So. I firmly believe that every single presentation really boils down to action at the end, not just mm -hmm. information, because information is useless without action. Mm -hmm. And to an earlier point, you can send all the information you want in a slide deck for distribution in an email, 
why do you need to be present? It's mm -hmm. because you, with your, you make the material come alive as a presenter. You make people care about it. And you make people care about taking that action at the end. So to this question, I would say it comes down to understanding who your audience is, doing that research on them, and really taking the time to think about what they need to do with this information, whether through asking them directly or through asking people, if you don't have access to them, like the CEO, asking people around them what they would need to do with that information. Does this mean if there is no action to take, then you should cancel the presentation and just send an email? Yes, I believe that every presentation needs mm -hmm. to have an action you inspire. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you don't need to be present as a speaker. You can just email them the information. What if we think that they might want to ask us questions? Then, then it's one-on-one. On one on one. Then it would be a meeting instead of a presentation, mm -hmm. more of a dialogue rather okay. than Got a it. presentation. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. All right. Uh, we have another question from the audience. How do you deal with unexpected questions? Did you use A or B? Sometimes it reduces confidence as you think of the correct answer. I feel you. I see you, John. I totally resonate with this. <laughs> and I, I'll actually demonstrate three techniques for responding to this by using this question. The first one would be to just pause. As I'm doing now, just pausing. They will see you thinking they're not going to interrupt you. You may feel pressured to answer quickly, but don't. They want to hear a good answer from you. So take the time to really think about what you want to say. I had one colleague who, whenever they were asked a question, would jump straight into answering it. And you could see the wheels turning in their mind as they tried to figure out the point they were trying to make. And everybody was listening to it and struggling with that person. You don't want to make the audience struggle with you. So pause before you answer. Really take the time to think about it and only speak when you know what you're going to say. The second technique I would recommend is asking clarifying questions mm. if you don't understand. So to this question, if I didn't understand it, I would ask, so what I'm understanding is that your question is how to deal with unexpected questions and what techniques you want to use to handle those kinds of situations. If I don't have a correct understanding, the other person can clarify. That gives me more time to think about what my answer is going to be as well. And it makes everybody in a better position. The last technique would be commenting on the question itself to buy a little time. This is a technique I don't recommend highly, but it's one you can use in, in rare instances where you have nothing left in your arsenal. And this is things like, that's a great question, or that's something I hadn't thought about before. I say it's something I don't highly recommend because mm -hmm. if you keep saying that, that's a great question. That's a great question. It's not going to feel like a great question. <laughs> so using those three techniques in that order, mm. pausing primarily, that's how I would respond to unexpected questions, just to give yourself more time to think. I have a question on the pausing. Yeah. Do you have to explain that you're thinking? Because for me, I've observed that I feel uncomfortable with silence in a meeting or in a presentation. So I feel this need to explain myself. So I, I would say, let me think, or give me a second. But is that necessary? I would recommend it based on the setting you're in. In a virtual mm. setting, it might not be so clear, and people mm. will interpret the silence as something has gone wrong with the tech. In <laughs> that case, you should say, let me take some time to think about that. Okay. But if you're in an interperson setting, and it's very clear that you, are, you have your head down, you're thinking about it, no one's going to interrupt you. Mm. And just own that space. <laughs> Don't feel compelled to answer because you feel this perceived pressure from everyone else. Yes. You don't really feel that way most of the time. Yes, so true. Um, it might be, um, it might be that I just got used to always feeling like I have to fill space right. um, instead of not just like being present and. Like, it's okay. Space is okay, basically, is something that I'm trying to actively work on. Yeah, I think, and it goes back to that point about pausing and making them different lengths and durations. Instead of just the words, it's right. really the pauses we take that we right. have to embrace as part of the presentation. Right. I have one last question. Uh, Chris, I notice you have very good eye contact. That means you're looking at the camera. Right. 
you're not looking at whatever is going on here. Right. Tell us why you do that and why it's important. It's so hard to do this in a virtual setting because I want to look at you who is- Me too, I want to look at you. (laughs) But it's in a virtual setting, you have to look at the camera because then the other people see you looking at them. And to the earlier point about a presentation being about you and making the material come alive, you need to establish that personal connection with people, especially in a virtual setting where we're physically disconnected. And eye contact is a great way to make that happen. So making that effort to not look at the person speaking and really look at the camera, it's so hard to do. But with practice and training, it becomes a lot easier. Same thing. I raise my hand. I've been trying to practice because looking at the camera is so weird. It's not it's not the same in real life. Right. In real life, you're looking at the person. Right. Um, looking at you in your eyes. But if I look at you in your eyes, I'm looking down the screen. Exactly. This actually, like, this is a whole other mental shift for me that I needed to, like, practice a lot. It does not feel natural. It does not. And for me, it's this little green dot. So it's really (laughs) weird to see. For people that have trouble with that eye contact initially, what I recommend is you can put googly eyes up there. (laughs) Just draw your attention to it. If you have a stuffed animal, prop it up so yes. that you, you, you're motivated to look at it yes. and that will ease that transition. Yes, totally. I wish that for the Zooms and the Google Meets out there, find a way to position the person you're talking to on top of the screen, mm-hmm. making it easier for us to establish eye contact. All right. All right. Mm-hmm. So last but not least, tell us how we can work with you and, and what types of programs and coaching services do you provide? Absolutely. So I work as a communication and presentation coach for technical professionals. I offer three kinds of services. One is my online course. I aim for this to be an affordable way for people to learn storytelling and presentation in a supportive peer community setting. The second offer that I have is one-on-one coaching. So I work with you one-on-one to really build up good habits when it comes to presentation, storytelling, communication, typically over a three-month time period to build Mm. those new habits. Mm. And as a part of that, I can also do one-off sessions if necessary. If you have a big presentation coming up, Mm. you just need one session to really make it good. That's what I also offer. And the third thing is company workshops. So I work with companies, their teams, customizing to their particular goals that they need to teach. Storytelling or presentation, how to make that really good at the team level. Tell us about the um, course that you run. Yeah. Does it, is it recorded? Is it live? How does it work? It's a, kind of a hybrid format. So mm-hmm. I want to make it as flexible as possible for working professionals who have very busy schedules. And so it's on-demand videos. You can watch anytime that you want. Mm-hmm. Each new lesson is released per week. So you have one new lesson to watch. It's about 10 minutes long every week. Mm-hmm. And then you have an assignment that takes you about 20 minutes to complete. Every week? Every week. Okay. And in addition to that, I have synchronous time in live sessions. So we meet as a group in small groups from the class to really Mm -hmm. practice this all together. And my Mm -hmm. hope through that format of making it both flexible and also synchronous Mm -hmm. is giving people the opportunity to learn at their own pace, but also come together and practice together. I love that. And how many live sessions is part of this um, course? It would be two live sessions a month and 16 total lessons. So 16 weeks or four months. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that that that's a very good setup. It's a it's a long term commitment, but a very small time commitment per week. And my right. hope through that is to really cultivate those new habits to get people right. really confident about these skills and really get to know each other as part of it. Right. And does it always have a beginning and end date or it's ongoing? It does have a beginning and end date, mm-hmm. but multiple cohorts I'm planning for in the future. So they'll have oh. different stuff. Yeah. Okay, okay, got it. And for the homework that we do. Does does it build on uh, one, one week after another or is it different homework week after week? Right. I have one big project that I've stretched across the 16 weeks uh, and you build it over time. So okay. by the end, you have your final product. I see. And do we present it back to you at the yes. end? Or? Every assignment involves you recording yourself. Oh, my gosh. So that your final <laughs> assignment is giving that final presentation. Oh, my gosh. That... The- yeah, that, that would be so helpful. Um, and also very structured so that we don't have to think about how do we actually get better at this because you have come up with a structure for all of us. 
that's my hope. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was so good having you on my live stream. I learned a ton. Now I have to go write down that magic phrase, yeah. inspire action on my post-it note. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much, Nancy, for the yeah. answer. Thank you for the uh, folks who, who were able to join us live. And thank you for all of your questions and comments. And I will see you in my next live stream, hopefully. Thank you all. Bye.